It's a glorious day out here in the UK and yes, the shorts are out people. However, when I put the Jeep Renegade 4xe through its paces, it was actually pouring down with rain. This in turn gave me the opportunity to see how its on and off-road capabilities would fare in trickier situations. Now the plug-in hybrid starts from £32,000 while the Trailhawk that we've got over here, the top spec level trim, starts from around £36,000. This is a lot more expensive than its non-electrified variant, which can be found around £23,000. Now, if you'd like a detailed breakdown between the different trim levels and indeed some of its competitors, do check out our written review, which will go into a bit more detail and be down in the description below. Also down there, you'll find links to our social media platforms. So if you're on Instagram or on Twitter, for example, we'd very much appreciate a follow. And it goes without saying, if you want to see more from the channel, definitely do subscribe and hit that bell notification if you haven't already. Now let's kick things off, shall we, with the exterior design. And here I think Jeep has achieved a perfect blend between an off-road vehicle and one that you'll want to be seen driving around in and around the city. From the front, you've got this quite aggressive look and it's got almost a cute type of design when it comes to its headlights. It actually reminds me of the all-electric Honda E. There is also really large plastic bumpers, which I'm normally not a fan of on regular SUVs, but in this respect, I fully appreciate the use case because, well, you don't want rocks damaging, let's say, your paintwork. Now, the same sort of design philosophy extends around the side of the vehicle where you've got pretty large plastic wheel arches and side skirts. The wheels that we've got are the 17-inch alloys, which are also fitted with off-road tires. Of course, if you go for the cheaper trims, this will also depend, and you have the option to change it as well. Now, as for the rear, Jeep have made it a little less aggressive, whereby you're treated with curved panels. The tail light design is also pretty unique, whereby it integrates the indicator within the light itself. As for the Trailhawk trim, you also do get a rear tow hook, which is capable of up to 1,500 kilograms of towing capacity at least on a brake trailer now as this is an off-roader it comes with built-in roof rails as standard on any level trim as for the color i know this bright orange won't be for everyone however i quite like it if you'd like to choose there's a variety of different color options from pastel to metallic and you even have a matte green option in the trailhawk model Furthermore, the bonnet on the Trailhawk is slightly different, whereby there's a black middle section which differentiates it from its cheaper siblings. Now, transitioning inside the vehicle, some might argue that the interior is a bit bland and a little bit basic. However, I feel that it's very much practical because if you're going to come in from outdoors and you're going to be very wet or, let's say, muddy, or even if, let's say, you have pets, then the last thing you want to do is have, let's say, fabric, which is going to be very hard to clean. Instead, the plastic design that stretches all around the cabin is extremely easy to wipe down. Now the same could be said about practicality whereby the manufacturer has opted for physical buttons and knobs and I've got again no issues with that because well quite frankly the last thing you want to do if you've come in from a really wet day and have wet fingers is to be playing around with capacitive touchscreen buttons or controls. In this respect you've got physical climate controls and a volume wheel and another one that also determines the drive modes and we'll touch upon those in our driving section. Next to it you've also also got a 12 volt socket for example if you want to plug in a dash cam and in case you're interested do check out our roundup it'll be down in the description below of our favorite dash cams that you want to get and there is a usb socket and a 3.5 millimeter jack which seems to be quite a rarity nowadays now these connections can be used to connect up to the infotainment system whereby here you've got an 8.4 inch display which supports android auto and apple carplay what we found is there were a few hiccups with android auto specifically when playing back media over USB but of course there is Bluetooth if you so wish to use it. Now elsewhere the actual display itself is pretty poor where viewing angles aren't optimized and furthermore the resolution seems a little bit poor. Let's say when you pop into reverse on the Trailhawk and you get the rear view camera the resolution that you get placed on your 8.4 inch display just looks well pretty shoddy. Now as for the sound system you get a six speaker audio configuration where you've got four speakers at the front of the cabin and two at the rear. If you'd like a detailed review of the audio system itself do check out on your pop-up banner or in the description below. What I'll say in a nutshell is that the system will be okay but isn't actually that exciting and is potentially a little bit disappointing unless you were to go for the more expensive Kenwood option. Now continuing on with the subject of practicality the steering wheel itself 
itself is really easy to grip and behind it it's actually quite intuitive because Jeep have integrated two rockers one on the left which is used for seeking media and on the right hand side to adjust the volume or indeed mute it if you so wish. Now at the front of the steering wheel you do also have a flurry of buttons where on the right hand side it's to adjust the cruise control settings and on the left hand side to interact with the instrument cluster. Speaking of which, the instrument cluster itself is semi-digital, whereby there is a screen planted at the middle of two gauges, and this screen itself it allows you to customize it to a certain degree, and it's also pretty clever, whereby it switches between green and blue, depending if you are on EV or petrol modes, respectively. The gauges on the side, one is a rev counter, and the other one is a power indicator, which also doubles up to show you if you're going to be charging the vehicle's battery. Now, in terms of storage capacity, there is a small bay found at the front of the center console which allows you to store away let's say a smartphone if however you have a larger sized one like the Samsung Galaxy S10 plus and you have it plugged in it won't quite fit in flush on the plus side there is a little compartment found towards the middle of the center console allowing you to place any size smartphone and have it plugged in and without it wobbling around too much and you've got two cup holder spaces the armrest itself is uh, movable in other words it can slide depending on terms of your um, your reach and in terms of your your arms and it doesn't quite move so easily so therefore if you've got a heavy arm on your stronger arm than myself then it won't be sliding around now within it it does reveal a compartment storage which allows you to place a let's say a smaller size purse or a wallet now of course you've got the door compartments where all four doors will fit a 500 milliliter bottle and furthermore the front doors themselves will allow you to place a larger size purse or larger size valuables and of course one has the glove compartment if you want to hide your valuables from let's say prying eyes now as for the boot it's easy to operate it has got hydraulics making it just a little bit easier as you might expect the boot also gets pretty high up meaning that i'm just under six foot i have no issue in terms of loading and unloading the vehicle now here here the boot capacity is 330 litres and if you were to put the seats down you get 1277 litres. Furthermore I quite like the fact it's got some fixing points and in our model where it's got the function pack it allows you to have a 40-20-40 split therefore allowing you to store away longer goods if you so wish by putting down the middle seat. Now elsewhere the boot lip isn't raised making it easy again to unload or offload goods and furthermore the boot floor is relatively relatively flat. I say relatively because there's a very slight lip between the lower section of the rear seat and the boot floor itself. It is also adjustable in terms of the boot floor height which makes it again a little bit useful for those people who want to transport larger goods including if you want to take a spare wheel with you. Now as for headroom and legroom it's absolutely plentiful no matter where you sit in the cabin and here the Jeep Renegade 4xe will seat up to five occupants. I am just under six foot and I've got loads of room on top of my head at the rear of the cabin let alone at the front where you've got manually adjustable seats here I'd go as far as saying as six foot seven individuals will fit pretty comfortably here although you might be a little bit squeezed if you've got three occupants at the rear now if you're not going to use the middle seat it can be pulled down at least in the model we've got with the function pack and means that you can take away those longer goods or indeed reveal an armrest with two cup holders Furthermore, there is a little practicality note that the Jeep have added and you've got a USB slot at the back, so therefore rear occupants can charge their devices. Now as for the seat comfort, I think it sits in between a firm and cushiony ride, whereby it's not going to give you a backache if you're going for longer drives, and equally it's not going to throw you around if you're going on, let's say, rougher terrain. Now furthermore, I do like the fact that Jeep has integrated removable and rubbery mats, which means that yet again the manufacturers thought about having, let's say, wet or muddy feet, and therefore makes it easy to clean the vehicle and keep it kind of pristine. Now this perfectly leads me on to cabin noise, and here the Renegade 4xe isn't exactly the most insulated cabin in the world, whereby you'll be able to hear wind deflecting off the A-pillars, which aren't exactly aerodynamic, and also off the side view mirrors which are pretty large for obvious reasons given it is an off-roader after all. You can also hear the petrol engine tickling away at the front of the vehicle and that could also mean that well you're not going to be in a completely serene environment. But with that said this is an off-roader off after all 
and as a result it's no surprise that the cabin isn't super well insulated and it won't compete with premium SUVs that have double glazing and acoustic glazing that prevents you from hearing the external environment. In fact in some cases you might argue that you'll want to hear the environment around you so you can hear if there's large debris or rocks that are kind of hitting the inner side of the um, chassis. So it's all relative and in this case for an off-roader I have no certain complaints. Now in terms of its suspension and handling characteristics it's again no surprise that this vehicle has been more tailored for outdoor and rough terrain usage rather than either pleasant driving around inner city commutes where you're going to have let's say the likes of active air suspension in certain SUVs and likewise it's not exactly a sports utility vehicle where it's going to have really hard suspension meaning that you can throw it around country roads without expecting it to have a slight bit of body roll. So effectively what I'm trying to say over here is that you should expect some body roll and you're going to expect to feel some of the road and given the tyres that you have it is also going to come across with road noise. It's kind of no surprise you just have to set your expectations in check and make sure that well if you're looking for this vehicle that you are looking as at an off-roader rather than just a regular family sized SUV where there are plenty of those on the market. Now granted its suspension setup won't be ideal for inner city commutes like we are doing right now but it's going to be perfectly suited for off-road terrain. Now here the vehicle comes in five different modes at least on the Trailhawk and here you can choose between auto, rock, sand and mud, snow and of course sport mode. Now sport mode is a little bit laughable whereby in all honesty I feel that it's kind of lost in this vehicle because it effectively keeps the revs a bit too higher than it should do. There, there is a caveat to this that if you want to get the fastest 0 to 60 time then you want to lob it in sport mode as it disengages the electronic uh, stabilization and therefore means that you kind of launch a little bit faster but we'll, we'll touch upon that a bit later on. Now effectively all I'm trying to say over here is that the car is perfect for off-road driving. You're not going to find yourself well stuck or trapped in certain degrees. Now the vehicle itself has got a all-wheel drive system that gives it perfect traction and if you're going to be driving under nine miles an hour and that's really specific because under nine miles an hour you can initiate the four-wheel drive lock and therefore means that you have a constant four-wheel drive system at any given time under nine miles an hour. If you were to exceed nine miles an hour what you'll find is that the all-wheel drive system becomes on demand so where it's needed the car will determine what it really needs in terms of giving you the best traction. Now you might be thinking well where is the electric portion of this vehicle when it comes to its all-wheel drive system? Well it's actually really smart and Jeep have integrated a 60 horsepower motor that's located at the rear axle and that effectively guarantees that you can have an all-wheel drive system running at any point. Now it isn't a motor so therefore it's pa powered by the battery pack but when the battery pack runs out of juice there is a small motor mechanically connected to the petrol engine on the front which effectively diverts power to the rear axle, in other words the rear motor, and means that you've got an all-wheel drive system. Now I know some of you will be worried about traversing water but it's got a fording capability of 40 centimeters which isn't as large as some of its competitors, so for example the Land Rover Defender or even Jeep's very own Wrangler, but in this respect all the electric components are sealed and waterproof. Now its electric motor isn't just dedicated to providing you extra traction when you're on off-road terrain because it will also give you that extra needed power. Here combined with its 1.3 litre turbo petrol engine which is of course mounted at the front of the vehicle you'll get 180 kilowatts of power which equates to around 240 horsepower. That is of course if you get the Trailhawk, it's a little bit less if you go for the regular trims or the middle trim. Now in terms of getting to 60 miles an hour it's also pretty nippy and it's kind of surprising. If you put it in sport mode 
you can get it to 60 miles an hour in 6.24 seconds. If you go on auto mode, this figure extends up to 7.46 seconds, which in both cases is impressive for a car of its class and a car of its size. Now, in terms of its top speed, it's limited to 124 miles an hour, and should you opt for EV mode only, it'll be 81 miles an hour, which would still suffice for a lot of individuals. Now here you've got three different modes to choose from, hybrid, which effectively uses both the engine and EV modes intelligently. And you've got the electric mode, which you might want to utilize independently if you're driving in town and want to have it running in all electric mode and therefore improve your fuel efficiency. And you've also got this e-save button, which effectively means that it recharges the battery pack from its petrol engine and that motor that I mentioned before and furthermore also allows you to conserve the battery if you want to use it at a later time. It's all pretty smart and also very intuitive to use via the physical buttons found just by the dashboard. Now here the switch between its petrol engine and its all-electric powertrain is actually really seamless and kind of gets you by surprise. You don't really notice the difference other than hearing the engine kind of kick into life. You don't really feel the transition happening. In fact, it's very smart because through the instrument cluster, you'll be able to see when it's driving on petrol mode and when it's driving on EV mode, where by green is EV mode, as you might expect, and blue, as it is right now, is on petrol mode. And again, the switch is done so seamlessly. Furthermore, the actual six-speed transmission, which is automatic, is again buttery smooth. You won't see and notice the shifts that are occurring. And even if you were to shift a left on the gear selector and therefore initiate a semi-automatic control, again, shifting through the gears, you're just not gonna notice the difference when you are going between, well, literally going through the gears. However, it's not all rosy because here the Jeep, despite its size, only houses a pretty small 11.4 kilowatt our battery. Now Jeep claims that you're going to get around 26 miles from it when in reality I found that if you were to drive purely in EV mode you will expect around 20 miles which isn't that impressive for a vehicle that is effectively a plug-in hybrid. Now on the plus side it does recoup and harvest energy pretty efficiently be it through its petrol engine or through regenerative braking which you can enable via a button found by the center console it's called max regenerative braking mode and you can disable it as well if you don't want to have a slight amount of brake pressure applied each time you lift your foot off the accelerator. What I'm trying to say over here is that while it isn't exactly the best in terms of its electric range it does seem to be pretty efficient in terms of how it recoups energy back into the battery pack. Now of course it is a plug-in hybrid so therefore you can plug it into the mains or indeed a public or home charger. Now what I find interesting is that Jeep only includes a mode 2 cable. Now the mode 2 cable is effectively your three pin socket to type 2 port and therefore gives you a 0 to 100 percent charge in a whopping five hours. It's a shame that the Mode 3 cable, which is your regular Type 2 to Type 2 cable, which you'll often find where you know, you've got a untethered charging point. So for example, a public charge point that you'll find in some supermarkets, for example, they don't have a cable and therefore you'll have to bring your own. And in this respect, it'll cost you a 300 pound option, which is, well, a pretty hefty amount to pay given that, well, it is a plug-in hybrid. You'd expect the plug-in hybrid to come in with its own cable but that's not the case when it comes to Jeep's philosophy at least. Now this also leads me on to efficiency whereby the Renegade 4xe has a 36 litre fuel tank and that's down from the 48 litre fuel tank that you'll find on the regular non-hybrid variant. Now in this respect you should expect around 36 miles per gallon which is acceptable for a car of its class however your mileage may vary depending on how you drive but I think you'll be very hard pressed to hit the 120 mile per gallon claim that Jeep has. Now in terms of safety systems it's a little bit basic on the cheaper trims however on the Trailhawk that we've got on review you've pretty much got everything that you can think of from cruise control to lane departure warning and lane departure assist steering assist 
blind spot warning and including reversing and front and rear parking sensors. It is slightly a shame that a rear view camera doesn't come as standard on the cheaper trims and likewise front and rear parking sensors only come into effect from the middle trim and above. Now on that note I do feel that the reversing camera isn't that well positioned as it's just on the boot lid and therefore a lot of dirt and muck that gets caught up specifically when you're on off-road terrain given that this is what this car is designed for will go on there and there's no means of cleaning it unless you get a kitchen roll or a, a handkerchief or something and clean it yourself each time you go through some muddy terrain. Now this all really leads me on to my verdict and here I feel Jeep has managed to output a quite niche product where the Renegade 4xe doesn't have too much competition. At least in the UK, all we've got is the Land Rover Defender plug-in hybrid, which starts from upwards of £70,000. You have, of course, got the likes of the Mitsubishi Outlander, or let's say the Toyota RAV4, but those cars don't have the same sort of off-road capabilities as the Jeep Renegade. And as a result, it's quite hard to see where its competitors can really keep up in off-road terrain. Of course if you're someone who is looking for a non-off-road vehicle this vehicle was never meant for you and it's not a car that you should even consider because there are more luxurious interiors or better driving experience that you can get or even potentially more power even from an all-electric powertrain but in this respect if you want something that combines off-road capabilities with the fact that you've got an electric portion that not only delivers all-electric range for around 20 miles and furthermore can give you instant torque delivery across two axles then the jeep renegade is for you as a result it gets a performance award for effectively being a fantastic performer although we would have given it our best buy award had the vehicle offered around 40 to 50 miles of all electric range but that's just our thoughts and opinions about it so do let us know in the comments below what you make of it and of course if you like this video give it a like subscribe and favor and share as it always helps the channel grow i've been chris from totally ev take care of yourselves and goodbye